experience. Nothing. Not even dreams. He's after us in our dreams. Dreams are real. You know, dreams can't hurt you. They're just dreams. Sweet dream. No bad dreams about Aunt Maggie. But my dreams aren't like yours. That's why they're called dreams. Dreams are not real. She lives in my dreams. Sweet dreams, my angel. In my dreams, I love you. From my dreams. Howdy folks, welcome to another episode of Screen Dreams. I'm your host Cyrus Haley and with me, as always, is my co-host Daniel Ferguson. How you doing, Dan? I am good. I am very good. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Uh, today the film we are talking about is the 2018 Coen Brothers film The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Here's a clip. <laughs> Maybe some of y'all have heard of me. Buster Scruggs. Known to some as the San Saba Songbird. I got other handles, nicknames, appellations, and cognomens. But this one here, I don't consider to be even halfway earned. Misanthrope? I don't hate my fellow man, even when he's tiresome and surly and tries to cheat at poker. I figure that's just the human material. And him that finds in it calls for anger and dismay is just a fool for expecting better. Ain't that right, Dan? And we're back. So, I picked this one this week because um, one of my favorite films in recent history, I would say. <laughs> uh, when it came out, I, I could not believe this was an actual... I thought I was, like, I, I was having an out-of-body experience. I was enjoying it so much, as you could imagine, yeah. knowing my preferences. Yeah, yeah. Well... Uh, th this time was the second watch for me, and I think I enjoyed it more this time than the first time. So it has got brilliant. It has got a lot of rewatch value. This film, mm. I've seen it four times now. Mm, yeah, uh, it's and it, it for me it is their best work to date. Love it. So love to hear that, Dan. So it it, it just is though, because it's this they it, they've there's so much going on in this film. There's a lot of I really just like the storytelling mastery. Mm. Each little story is so well told. Uh, down, down to down to the little de every little detail. It's there's so much attention to yeah. detail going on. Uh, it feels very effortless though, because they're so they're such seasoned veteran filmmakers. They are. You yeah. kind of that you're just like yeah, all right, you know, whip up a little anthology and. Yeah, each one's going to have slightly different tonal, you know, tonal choices, yeah. and yeah, it's going to be slight. And it's it it, it feels so sure-handed. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Stylistically, I think they've sort of taken a step, a new step with mm. certain aspects with this one as well, which I personally am a big fan of. Uh, mm -hmm. The things that I've sort of pointed out and the the notes that I've got. Which I can read out for you if you like. They're only they're only Let's quick go. short ones, but uh, you know, style style has a uh, has some something to do with it. I think what what I what really interests me about this film. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the sense the sense of place in a, in a Coen Brothers films is obviously very big. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's huge to them. Um, so I when I watching the the uh, Del Toro interview on YouTube they even said in that interview they d they don't think they could make a film if it didn't have a like a very strong sense of place mm. that is a case yeah. with western films uh while you know western films in general the place is almost the characters are born of that place and you are aware of the place um more than you would in, in normal films. Um, but mm. I would say that that's quite interesting to compare how this film has that compared to other Western films. Um, and the, 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 the comparing this to other Western films, okay, I, I mean, I have a, a thesis that about this film, which I think I just got to get out of the way just so that we can put that out there and then talk on that. Mm. Um, because uh, you, as you... I'm sure you know I've I've seen a lot of westerns. Um yeah. A lot of them from from you know every era really. Um and I think the Coens have as well. And they have as well, yeah. Uh, and the references, the subtle choices they're doing just for, you know, for for films that came out 60 years ago that they they like. Uh there's this film is full of them. Um 
but I would like to just before that ask you did, did when the book opens at the beginning yeah which is obviously like giving it a kind of fairy tale kind of anthology i think that's the beginning of um like a one of the one of the classic disney films i think opens with a shot they zoom into a book and then the book opens um yeah but it, but anyway it's a very it's like it's a classic sort of thing you know, you have the ballad of buster scruggs scruggs book but the uh the first page it says I don't know if you read this. Uh, dedicated to Gaylord Gilpin. Yeah, I know. Did you read? Yeah, I noticed that, but uh, yeah, I didn't. So I paused it, and and this is, I think, a perfect thing to encapsulate the Coen Brothers and what I really love about them. This is the dedication at the beginning of Buster Scruggs. <clears throat> to Gaylord Gilpin, who shared these stories and many more alike. One night in a camp above the Roaring Fork, till approach of morn stained the sky, and our esteem for him stained our trousers. <laughs> that is, uh, that's legit. That is the beginning of the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. <laughs> a ejaculation joke, just hidden in there, just like, yeah, yeah. Anyone who pauses that is going to get a tasty little cum joke. Um, so <laughs> they always have, they al they're always hiding a little, they're like, they're not taking it too seriously. Um, and that's what I really love. Um, in terms of my thesis for this film, obviously, I think death is the main theme, and it, and, yeah. and each piece of the anthology is um, uh, is a slow development of how death uh, can be treated in cinema, but also how death was treated throughout the history of cinema, specifically Western films. So the first uh, the first section with the Ballad of Buster, you know, with Buster Scruggs is like, you know, Gene Autry, uh, Roy Rogers, Sons of Pioneers movies where they're singing and everyone goes to heaven and when someone dies, they're not, they don't even, it's not taken, it's like a cartoon, it's, it's not taken seriously. The death is, they go straight to heaven or hell and it's a cartoony fairy, fairy land, you know. Then the next one uh, is more in the line of early John Wayne films where you have sort of Native American attacking and the, the, the death is slightly more, honorable and but it, it's slightly more real but they're kind of they want it to be you know kind of still like a game like a like a kid playing with action figures you know cowboys versus indians and oh you know the cowboys kill so it's slightly more serious but barely it's still cartoony it's still a cartoony meal ticket first this is you know the armless legless guy gets thrown into the river this is the first death that really is tragic uh effect yeah tragic and affects one and this is more in the style of like I would say Sergio Cobucci snowy westerns. Like Sergio Leone had a lot of uh, armless and legless people in his films, um, you know, in the spaghetti westerns. Um, and so it's kind of reminds me a little bit more of that. And the deaths were a lot more. The characters were a lot more twisted and sadistic and real and and complex in spaghetti westerns. Um, so I, I I'm slightly more reminded of that. Um, and then. You know, you go into the Gold Canyon and it's like, you know, Tom Waits mining on his own. That death really hits home. And slowly but surely, the development of death, the girl who got rattled, she kills herself. And that's really... It's another, tra really, another like, tragic one. Mm. There's always this kind of like tragedy and irony sort of uh, sort of weaving its way into it, isn't it? Um, yeah. And and I f but I feel it gets increasingly more serious with its... Uh, w w each story is a development in a direction where they're taking the idea of death in a f uh, for, for the characters in the film or just death in general more seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's the Coen brothers also thinking about their own death, possibly, um, and the fact they've made so many films. It's uh, It's pretty incredible that it got to this point and this film got made and Netflix put the money towards it and those are real covered wagons stretching on for a mile real covered wagons mm. my heart it just i can't you know i get so happy yeah watching the these scenes yeah yeah um it did take a like a really long time to to sort of eventually materialize didn't it i mean they were just mm -hmm. it was kind of a, a a side project that just kept getting added to and added to over years and years and years so it is exactly marvelous how it has turned out so spectacularly well um 
Mm. Yeah, no, I I think yeah, that's interesting. So you you so you think they're like referencing referencing different periods and different different eras of the Western genre. Yeah, and they're 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 not only doing that; they're doing that through a, a, a sort of semi coherent timeline of the history of westerns there's a little bit of back and forth there where i feel like the gold canyon feels a little bit more like one of those um anthony mann westerns directed uh, directed by anthony mann starring uh jimmy stewart mm. that's what the the tom waits section felt like it's kind of um you know uh, uh basking in the splendor of the land a lot more which anthony mann's yeah. films i feel well, that's, did brilliantly yeah that's interesting because that that's something that definitely i want to bring up and talk about how mm. the landscape is portrayed yeah in this film well should we try should we try and take it vaguely in order and we talk a little bit about but you know just go go one by one yep 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 okay okay so um I was I was watching I think it was the BAFTA interview with the Cohn brothers and the the question the the guy asking the questions or the moderator was like um uh, by the way great choice opening your film with uh, uh the sons of pioneers and Joel uh, uh kind of under his breath goes <clears throat> you know well we've done that before um obviously talking about the beginning of the Big Lebowski when they play the tumbling tumbleweeds and uh I mean, I'm just a huge fan of the Sons of Pioneers generally, so it's great to hear a, um, what's his name? Uh, oh God, Tim Blake Nelson. It's just great to hear Tim Blake Nelson doing a version of Cool Water and having it, yeah, having them instead of having the, you know, the choir doing the water in the back, having them coming up with the idea of it actually echoing through the canyon, yeah, as he's clopping along and his horse, Old Dan, which is. Obviously, the name of the horse in the song, Old Dan and I, with throats burned dry and souls that cry. Uh, Old Dan is 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 trotting in time with the cool water. Yeah, yeah. I I just can't help but smile while I say that. Yeah. Tim Blake Nelson uh, has kind of, he has quite a cool voice. It's weird voice. In the, in, the j- in the jailhouse now, where, you know, he the, actually recorded, in, in the, yeah. he actually recorded that yeah. track. Uh, yeah. I love that version. <laughs> so do I. I, I think it's a legitimately that. good version. Yeah, oh brother, art that version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, it's great. I, I, uh, I might. Yeah, I mean, you can't say it's your favorite version because it's Jimmy Rogers, obviously. But like, it's <laughs> it's, it's it, the fact the fact that it, it's even making me think is you know it's kudos, impressive. Kudos. He's got interesting phrasing on it, yeah. which I quite like. Mm. He makes an interesting choice with his voice. Um, yeah, yeah. And, so yeah, I'm glad cool. they got he's him good. on more, more singing some more. Um, yeah, well, you know, he's the San Saba songbird. You know, I got many nicknames, cognomens, appellations, and cam handles, <laughs> or, or what? I, I don't know how they find those words. Yeah, they, like, they keep they keep bringing up more nicknames. <laughs> yeah, like, I looked up in the encyclopedia for nicknames, and there was like two, but they're like he goes. I got other handles, appellations, cognomens, and and he's, I think he says three or four more. And it's like, like he, the, the, he has so many different words for the name nickname, and then he has about five different nicknames. Like, the writing is so dense in, in that first section that, that, you know, clearly you're as good a judge of her human beings as you are a specimen of one. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one of the best lines I've ever heard and surprised that, that's, that it took till 2018. To write that line, well, the, yeah, I think that, the that sounds like Bro- a Marx Brothers line. Yeah, they are just outstanding at writing dialogue. They are just outstanding. Yeah, I, I, and uh, the the first, you know, the first story, and then also the mm. last one when they're in the carriages. Yeah. I mean, that is that's showing that is, off. that is just a dialogue piece, isn't it? In its entirety, mm. there's nothing else that happens much, but that is just very, very good. Yeah, well, they've always been very focused on on lexicon. Um, for, uh, all the way back to raising Arizona. In fact, there um, people from Arizona complained. They were like, "Nobody talks. Nobody talks like this," you know, because obviously H.R. McDonough is like, "You're a little desert flower," you know. And they, when they, w- when they were writing articles about how they wanted Nicolas Cage to sound in Raising Arizona, they said they wanted him to sound like he was, he had only ever learned how to speak from watching the uh, shopping channel, like infomercial channel. Mm. and reading the bible so it's a combination <laughs> of bible verse and shopping channel 
that's how they tried to write his dialogue. And then again with Fargo, people complained about Fargo. Like, we don't talk like that, eh? There's a lot of, <laughs> they, you know, they they don't give a shit in terms of it being, they, they, they really have a specific pitch they're trying to hit with their dialogue. Mm. And they, they roll with that. They have a lexicon and they go with it. And, and it's really on show in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yeah. yeah. Like the, you know, the, uh, on account of that bird's mellifluous warble. Yeah. <laughs> on account of that bird's mellifluous warble. How <laughs> dare you? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's very uh, verbose and, uh, yeah. Verbose <laughs> is the right word, yeah. How many of the nicknames can you remember? Obviously, there's Buster Scruggs. I know, I love the nicknames. They're like, every time we meet somebody else, they mention a new nickname, don't they? So I got Buster Scruggs, the West Texas tit. Yeah, one's like the Harbinger of Doom as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Harbinger of Demise. Yeah, yeah. the Harbinger yeah. of Demise, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Which is also tying in thematically, obviously. But he goes from having um, like these very like very like nice sounding nicknames to Harbinger playful of nicknames to Harbinger of Demise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Reaper of Souls. Um, that is kind of what's yeah, funny I... about his character though, isn't he? He's like this like jolly fellow, but he's like just com- completely he's like a killing machine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appears to do, yes. Yeah, yeah. It really feels like Roadrunner or something. Yeah, but the, I mean, the, the style is is yeah. I mean, it's very cartoonish. That's something that I was going to bring up, like how yeah. the la- you know, that opening scene where, you know, the the landscape, the colors are saturated. You know, they're not. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's high. It's hyper real. Valley. And um, how the clouds are. You know how the clouds are sort of moving and they look like Toy Story. All f- and, and then he's like breaking the um the you know the fourth fourth wall constantly. Mm. Um, mm. it's very uh, and obviously you know when he when he dies as well he's got the little angel wings. It's all mm. it's all very cartoonish. Um, so it's, it's the kind of singing cowboy taken to an extreme because this is the first one. Let's keep it playful. Let's keep it. And apparently that's the first one they ever wrote. They wrote all of that dialogue. Uh, maybe. 15 20 years ago how, i mean how do you sit on on that kind of dialogue how do you sit on because of that particular bird's mellifluous warble for 15 years <laughs> i don't understand it um but but they they did sit on it um and uh yeah uh, uh it's 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 a good way to start um actually one thing i wanted to bring up was um when he's on the horse he goes uh, you know i've got many nicknames and he pulls out but this is one I don't agree with, and he pulls out his <laughs> yeah. uh, bounty poster, and they, it says misanthrope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which uh, the Coen brothers have been accused of being misanthropes. Yeah, yeah. That they that in all of their films they take the piss out of their characters, and they kind of have disdain for their characters, and they don't, you know, they think that H. R. McDonough is dumb, and that you know Llewellyn Davis is like you know uh, just a, a fool, and a, well, not a fool, but a bit of a prick, maybe. Yeah, he's a bit of a entitled uh lost cause yeah, isn't that's it? it yeah that's it that's perfect and 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 for a lot of a lot of their other characters you, you know the the hudsucker proxy guy and um even the big lebowski they, they, they're they accused of being a little bit misanthropic if that's a word well, misanthropic and, um, is more isn't it kind of more when you shut yourself off from society and you don't you have kind of a a clear disdain for your fellow man. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I th- yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go as far as that. I would say. No, I'm. I'm not saying that. I. I would. I would agree with that. I'm saying that's a criticism leveled at the Cohen brothers. And I would say that Buster pulling out that poster saying, "I'm not a misanthrope." You know, that's just the human material. Uh, and anyone, you know, expecting any difference, just a fool for thinking otherwise. Okay. That's them responding to that criticism. So you think. Which I think is unfounded criticism. Yeah, yeah. So you're kind of seeing that as a maybe a. You know, or, you know, they're from coming from their perspective and talking about themselves in an autobiographical yeah. sort of sense. 100%. That's that. Yeah. I don't. I, I see that. I, I could. I saw that the first. Yeah. I can't see that any other way, basically. That. Oh, well, uh, no, but, to me yeah. is them responding to that criticism yeah there's maybe so yeah people mm. i think you you i think you tend to look for that you tend to spot these things and tend to see things that way because i don't remember the last episode with uh you know tarkovsky you were uh, mm. you kind of read in between the lines in a similar way which is interesting um yeah i that's kind of yeah i sort, that's sort of how i uh 
watch stuff, I can't help but sort of think about the the story behind the story in a way. In a way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Though they certainly make likable characters, you know, and that's a uh, mm-hmm. that's one uh, one reason why you probably wouldn't say there's misanthropic, you know, because they were have that gift and that ability to show the uh the more likable side of humanity through through mm. cuz even even though their characters are flawed I mean L- Lewin Davis is a well, we'll go back to that example cuz that's another one that I watched pretty recently so it's still quite fresh mm-hmm. in my mind you do you know you are you're never not rooting for him as well and there, mm. I mean, I, maybe that's my just my experience. But I'm you, you, you a know. little bit when he drives past the the town where his son should be, and he doesn't turn. I think I kind of went, you know what, man, you don't deserve happiness. Fuck you. That's a side. Let's not get in. Let's not get deep into Lou and Davis because I think we'll have to do a pod on that because we clearly both quite like it. Incidentally, just to br- bring it back round to Buster, mm. um, uh, Lou and Davis is the only other film shot by Bruno Del Bonel. The- Bruno Del Bonel, mm, I mm. think, uh, who is the, the cinematographer who shot Amelie uh, and a lot of other things, Big Eyes, that um, thing. But yeah, it's it's the first time they didn't work with um, the you know Billy Big Balls. What's his name? Um, Deacons. First time they didn't work with Deacons um, since I think um, Blood Simple, and uh, excluding Lewin Davis. Um, so this oh, film right. was shot by a different cinematographer, the same cinemat- cinematographer as Lewin Davis. Yeah. Um, just as a well, there's some there's some heavy filters going on in this film. It's mm. also their first film shot digitally. The yeah, this first that ever kinda, digital film, right. and it's their longest film. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So what? Mm. What? Yeah. So what, the cartoonish sort of aspect of it. How does that sit with you in terms of? Um, style amongst other westerns. Uh, I think they were already kind of going that way. They were sort of teetering on the edge. Uh, as I say, I, I had now a body experience. Yeah, they've gone. They've... I, I, I like. I feel like I saw the face of God when, 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 when Tim Blake Nelson's <laughs> body starts flying up and he starts singing the harmony part to Willie Watson's. Yeah, let me tell you, buddy. Yeah. I was like, is. Did they make this film for me specifically? Because who the fuck else is into this? This is, did they, it's such a, yeah, I couldn't believe it when I was watching that scene. It is, it is such a niche specific tone they're pitching with that opening and opening it like that. Mm. I I was speaking to a guy I know who's really into film, watches films, although he's a filmmaker as well. And he said that, yeah, he really, he was like, nah, man, I, w- I was trying to watch Buster Scruggs. It really, really put, like, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it, you know, put me off. But then again, this guy loves Denis Villeneuve, so, so, so you know, whatever. Take of that what you, what you may. I'm mm. not going to say my opinions on that. But mm. I, I can see how that, that opening scene would put a lot of people off because it's so cartoony. It's so ridiculous. But for me, it's... the fact that he's singing harmony to the guy who just shot him and going, well, I should have seen this coming. Can't be top dog all along. Yeah. yeah. That uh, 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 that's uh, that's I felt like I dreamed that. That's so close to my heart. Yeah, you know yeah, that yeah. sort of tone is perfect. Mm. It's perfect. Yeah, that's why I'm it's, so excited about this film. Yeah, it's playful. It's you know, it, and it's not taking itself too seriously, um, as as you mm. sort of mentioned earlier. They they, they tend not to, um, and that's a and that's. Mm. That's one of their plus plus. That's one of their strengths, um, mm-hmm. and it, yeah, you hadn't seen this this genre um, presented in such a way before as well. Mm. It felt for something that there was, you know, a long history, uh, in in terms of film filmography, and uh, yeah, never never mm. seen anything quite like that before. Yeah, interesting place to start, but it gets more as as it goes on, it gets more serious, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I think I, but I think that's by design. Well, I the think theme, they... well, the theme of death itself. Yeah, yeah, the theme of death itself, which is important in this film, which you know we both, it's obvious, you know, it's uh, it's mm. obviously the main theme that runs through it all. 
um, you yeah. know, Buster Scruggs, the his char- character's attitude to death is lighthearted. Um, yeah, he starts singing. Exactly. He starts singing a song after he kills that guy. Mm. You know, it just uh, puts me in mind of a song, Surly Joe. Yeah, yeah. but then, but yeah. so you know, maybe that cut to maybe, his brother holding his head, going, Joey. Joey and yeah. he's like and his head and his eyes are open and it's pretty gnarly and then I mean you know cut back to Buster on you know mm. on the fucking bar you know slapping his spoys yeah um so yeah. so yeah maybe that's the that's the place to start I guess where maybe that's westerns were kind of like that as well where mm. you know cartoony everyone went to heaven at the end it's all good you know wrap it up with a nice bow don't have to worry don't have to think too much about the implications of death or the moral implications yeah. of killing and so it's all good maybe that's know? maybe that's re- the reason why it started with that one yeah um i, I yeah. would say so well yeah. let's let so the next the next one uh, we see uh, james Fra- franco yeah I'm not a I'm not a Franco man. I, I no, I'm I, not a huge fan either. Ne- yeah, I, I'm not. I don't know. I sort of don't really know what I make of him. To be honest, he's fine in this. He's fine, but I think I would have rather have somebody who I don't recognize. Um, like I think the guy who who did who was Billy Knapp was really good. Um, and I yeah thought, yeah he um, was yeah he he was very so good. you know and I know he's probably I think he's in some famous American TV show, but I I, I hadn't seen it. This is the first I'd seen of him, and I would have rather. Franco's character be an unrecognizable guy. Um, yeah, but I like yeah, this it story. Is a bit it's not it takes high. you out of the world, doesn't it? To be honest, yeah, it does. Yeah, because yeah. Tim Tim, Bl- Tim that. Blake Nelson is a you know obviously appears in the Coens, uh, mm. but uh, he's not. You know, you don't see him so much. So you can you can get more absorbed in his character. Whereas James Franco, I know what you mean. I I, I find that a mm. lot with films actually. Where they don't yeah. they don't need to cast such a big recognized celebrity name. I find it I find well, it sometimes some they sometimes they do need to. Sometimes they do need to cast a big celebrity name to you know bring the punters in. But I, I the Cohen brothers certainly don't. And it, it was weird that, that Franco was in this little section. But then, you know, he didn't do badly. I mean to, to give the man his due, he was fine. His his voice was a bit weird, but he was fine. Yeah. He was fine. And mm, you know, not bad, not particularly good. So, if we're going to stick with this theme of 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 the, the stick with the themes that we've already spoken about, Violence. how 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 do you see this? Yeah, it's still relatively cartoony. However, uh, like uh, just just an honorary mention of the guy going selfish bastard, and then getting a bow, uh, uh, you know, an arrow in the neck, and then pulling that arrow out, and then getting another one in the neck. Yeah. So there's still much like when Buster kicks the table and he shoots himself in the head and then he goes, fuck it, I'll do it two, twice more because I'm Bugs Bunny. And the guy shoots himself in the head three times. It's th- This one is a little bit less taking the piss, but it's like, no, we'll have two hours in the neck, though. We are kind of still taking the piss of the what? violence. It is still like a kid playing yeah. with his action figures. Yeah, I want, one, you know, one thing Cowboys that was uh, superb in this part, I thought, was just how well filmed that action sequence was. Mm, I uh, agree. You know, the, the arrows flying over his shoulder and, you know, mm-hmm. getting the guy who was riding off. That was really memorable. Very well yeah. sort of crafted um staged, cinematography yeah, staged. yeah uh that was absolutely yeah. fantastic i would i would say that um there is in this story we see the big the beginning of the second subtle the second subtle theme that plays se- second fiddle to death <laughs> In the oh, yeah. in this film, Ooh. um, that's a good country song right there. Playing second fiddle to death. <laughs> there you go. You can keep that yeah, one. That's my chorus. But the um, this strange alliances uh to navigate the harsh world, I would say, is mm. another another thing that kind of happens a lot. People, because remember, he he is is saved from hanging from that guy. And then he's already, yeah, there's guys already absolutely. talking about becoming his sidekick. Sidekick. You want a sidekick with me? Key, key to a good sidekick is being loyal. You got to stick together. That's a good sidekick. Yeah. And then he just sees guys coming over the hill. He's like, oh, damn it. And yeah, just yeah, turns yeah. his back on him I instantly. That, <laughs> That's that is great. That, so I think this comes early on to introduce that kind of thing as well, where people make these very strange uh, sort of companionships and alliances in order just to survive. I think that's something that you see. I'm not saying that the mm. you know the in the next story with the you know the uh, meal ticket, the, yeah, the the thespian 
what, what what's his name? The you, the limb the limbless uh, orator. <laughs> He's called like yeah the, the limbless orator. Has he got a name? Yeah, it's something like the thrush. It's, it's another. It's it's another bird. I think it's the thrush or something. Anyway, oh, that's I besides the I point. But that you okay. would say you could argue is another kind of strange alliance. Uh, obviously, definitely te- tempor- temporary. <laughs> I mean, that's the, mm. the well, that's where the tragedy uh, sort of lies in that story. Um, um yeah. and and that kind of continues um throughout um there's also the the strange bounty hunter dudes at the end that's kind of like the peculiar sort of alliance where mm. one distracts yeah. one person and the other one and mm. and then you also have that one where they you almost get married don't they sort of on the, on the yeah on the on the trail on so the I trail. Th- so I think that is undeniably another recurring and obviously the the you know deep sensual romance between tom waits and mr pocket let's not forget <laughs> <laughs> yeah he he does talk yeah he does, i'm he does, coming uh, yeah. <laughs> what well, oh, i'm coming i think that that is like easily tom waits's best appearance on on the screen for come me on then. now yeah uh, obvious yeah they were like they call up tom he's like no i don't Hey Tom, um, we need you to be a grizzled old panhandler. <laughs> we're shooting in Vermont for two, you know, two weeks. Yeah, uh, we're shooting in Vermont two weeks. What, what, what do you say? I was born for it, Joel. I was born. <laughs> That's yeah. He was perfect in it. He He's did. He did. Yeah. He did exceptionally well. In fact, that mm. def- definitely one of the my favorite parts of the whole film was his performance. I thought. Uh, I agree. I but agree. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so what do you make of that? That's another kind of interesting one. Uh, maybe that, yeah, I hadn't maybe really that's thought g- of that. Yeah, but I, when you think about it, though, that is just kind of part and parcel with Western films, isn't it? Um, mm. Yeah, people teaming up. The harsh, it, it is through. a harsh world. Uh, everybody knows that, and that's kind of when, with Western films, pe- what people have to do just to survive is is tends to be sort of a large part of the story. A large part of the character struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe I'm kind of maybe honing in too much on this film, and maybe that is just a ge- more of a general theme, perhaps. But uh, it's still a. It was still interesting and and striking. I think they examined that in a really interesting way, much better, mm. much better than I think I'd ever seen before. Actually, much more nuanced. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's also they also have again. Not taking themselves too seriously, the the guy teaming up with him, and then instantly, whilst talking about how important it is to stick together, decides not to stick together. Cut to James Franco wearing leg irons. Yeah, and the guy, the guy going, "Well, it's good enough. Hang him." Uh, which I think <laughs> that whoever they got to say that's a perfect delivery of that line. I know this yeah. is- casting by Ellen Chenoweth is always spot on. I, she, I think she's been casting their films. Way back to Blood Simple, or no, I think maybe Barton Fink might have been her first. Mm. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not going to check that. But anyway, Ellen deserves a shout out because finding that guy who can just go, "Well, it's good enough for me. Hang him." <laughs> yeah. yeah, perfect, perfect. Um, so what do you make of him saying, "There's a pretty girl," and then getting hung? Mm. To be honest, it felt like a cliche. It felt like a bit of a cliche. Mm. Yeah, I felt like I'd seen that scene before somewhere. Do you know what I mean? Um, so maybe you have, maybe it yeah. has something to do with the cliche because I don't think they would throw something like him like that without realizing that themselves. I think they are quite well. Uh, you know, they remade smart. True Grit, and the the original True Grit has a really famous hanging scene where um the guys are uh, hung in front of the whole town. And hanged in front of the whole town, mm. and um, then they you when know, in the True Grit remake they made, they inserted a Native American character. Uh, they each get a little bit to say their piece, and the Native American characters like goes like, "I would like to say," and then gets the a bag put over his head. Oh yeah, I remember that now. Yeah. So they they and so they've done yeah so they've done hanging scenes before. Um, I don't know. I think maybe let's move move on from Pan Shot. I don't really have much else to say about it. It was it's fun. It's a little bit of an adventure bank robbery robbery mm-hmm. adventure. I do love that scene though when the the kind of the money's all just blowing away in the wind. You know the bag yeah, of money yeah. and he's kind of yeah. 
that's oh that was there's something quite poetic and beautiful about that that part but yeah that's mm. another one my favorite part yeah that tension of the money kind of just gradually blowing away in the wind is uh yeah is a good nice little touch there i thought yeah i agree um okay moving on then to meal ticket with um dark man himself not dark man is he dark man mr Liam, Liam Neeson? Mr. Liam Neeson. Sir Liam Neeson. Mm. Um, mm. No, wait. Is he is he Dark Man or is he? He's taken, um, isn't he? I will find. Well, I will yeah, find yeah. you. <laughs> I will find you. Um, but what, is he, he's Dark Man, isn't he? Yeah, Dark Man himself. I don't know who uh, Dark Man Liam is. Liam Neeson. What do you mean, dude? Dark Man. He. Oh uh, man, Dark Man is um fun little Sam Raimi flick from the nineties where. He kind of morphs into different people. It's kind of riffing off the Invisible Man, and right, kind of cool. Sam, so like a comic book neo noir. Sam thing. Raimi has something to do with the Coens, didn't he? Did he? Didn't they work on his films when they were? Yeah, yeah. Um, Joel, Joel was assistant editor on Evil Dead, and they're they're like best mates. Sam Raimi's in a lot of the the Coen brothers' films, yeah, on, just in little tiny roles. Mm. And Ted Raimi is brother. Um, yeah, it's great to what watching the Evil Dead and seeing Joel Coen's name there as assistant editor. <laughs> It's pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, um, you got to get you got to get in the business somehow, though. Got to start somewhere. Yeah. And look, Evil Dead One is, um, I'm a fan. I am a fan. Um, yeah, but yeah, this one is the absolutely one of the one of the standout parts of the film for me. Yeah, Neeson. Neeson is actually good as well. I think he surprisingly fantastic. Yeah, he played. I would say it's, pitch, it's pretty it. pitch perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, that little song he sings is the only thing, apart from he d- does talk to the whore, but he has very few lines. Um, yeah, but it's and he's great. It's even that kind of when that's little that sinister smile at the end, you know, that was yeah, yeah, that's uh, perfect. Yeah. One interesting thing about the Coens is they never really show, they never reveal, um, the sort of the moment that things are leading up to. They never, they never actually reveal things and show things. They always, they always very much allude to things, don't they? Um, going back, well, in that scene, especially with the, the yeah, drop throwing him off the bridge. Yeah, um, um, you just know it's coming. You don't, I really, you don't want to see that. I mean, I don't want to see that. No, no. Point, the point is made. Exactly. Know, cutting back to the chicken but th- alone. But I think that's that's something that they do quite a lot. So just. Um, but yeah, that's uh, what can you say about that? I mean, there's <laughs> it is a great li- there's a great little story, um, mm. but it it just gives you an a sense of uh, the place and the towns uh, mm. uh, and the people. I think that's the, mm. the great the great story that it tells. Other than you know, obviously the the obvious story, but as an as an aside, I think it like takes you on the journey of from town to town touring with with Mm -hmm. them i think that is magnificent um because they're they're sort of you know it's they're building a world aren't they uh they're building their version of the wild west and that's Mm. and that's um a great part that for me that's the great a great part in the film you know they're like Mm. doing it and there's only like three people on like a snowy night yeah there's just got it's there's got a great atmosphere about it and yeah there it is tragic and it is um there's obviously a sort of more of a, a more a greater commentary about memory and culture and mm-hmm. appreciation for these sort of things um yeah and uh obviously the the conclusions drawn are are, are pretty bleak <laughs> pretty bleak yeah I think before we get there, um, uh, I, I'd like a just quick thing, because I was questioning myself here. Do you think Liam Neeson, obviously he throws him off the bridge, right, uh, and ch- trades him for a chicken, so he can't think that highly uh, of the armless man. Mm. Um, but I, do you think he, re- do you think he just actually just just d- doesn't like him at all and just is simply just using him I th- and him feeding him? the hot beans and going, look, come on, I don't care if it's burning your mouth. I want to feed you the hot beans. I can't be bothered. Yeah. Or, I know. think, I think the story 
uh, quite cleverly how they tell the story makes you think that he is um, affectionate towards him and he's sort of like his, you know, guardian um, mm. who really cares about what he's saying. You know, he ca- yeah. like, He actually cares. He, yeah. wa- he wants p- the people to, to, spread to this hear stuff. like yeah, but, uh, yeah. Shelley and, you know... Yeah, and uh, and all these things, he uh, he he could be somebody who's actually sort of passionate about all these things. Um, and the, and strangely, there is like a little scene where he is just kind of like holding him, or is that is he got is he using the he's pissing? Is he using the toilet? I think he might be using the but toilet. He actually. is. He's pissing. Yeah, but he and and he's uh, so excuse me. So he's, he's he is pissing in that scene, but but there is a small detail. Liam is sort of tapping him. With his index finger, somewhat affectionately. Yeah. However, I would say the first time I watched it, I was like, "Oh, well, he's his dad, or or friend, or whatever, and he cares about him, but he knows that he's going to starve to death, uh, you know, and he can't bear it, so he just throws him off the bridge, and 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 you know, he can't afford it, and it hurts him." But watching it again, um, and this is, I say, the fourth time I watched it today, I think the complete opposite. I think there are very subtle clues. Uh, like I said, the food being one of them, where he's trying to feed him the meat, and he's like, I'm still chewing the meat. He's and losing patience Liam, with him, isn't he? Yeah, he know? just leans in and goes, just fucking eat it, you little yeah. piece of shit. Yeah, you know, you limbless cunt who's not making me a dime. Yeah. You know, I'm you, like, they don't talk, they don't say anything to each other. Mm-hmm. He gets laid, and he, he the, the whore goes, do you want to buy your friend some? And he goes, I don't think he can. I think he's only done it once, you know. Yeah. Um, I, don't th- I think he hates him. I think he's... I, I really don't think he likes That's it. That's a great that was another little great piece of editing though, when it's kind of the, cut, the, yeah, the beginning yeah. and the end. And the mm. expression in his face had just slightly lowered. Do you know yeah. the point I'm talking about? Yeah. That really yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. A, just a simple editing cut like that was really effective. Um Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um yeah, I think you know, I think ultimately by the end you are you, it then becomes clear that he views him as a piece of property. Um, mm. you know, just like, just like the, you know, and, the, and that's with the comparison with the chicken, you know, just becomes yeah. like by the end, he's, he's willing just to swap him over. He was, he was, he was only interested was in him as a, as a, as a business tool, as a mm. money making tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. and he was caring for him and maintaining him, um, you know, for the sake of, uh, making money and, pro- and profit, um, yeah. you know, in the better times where they were making a bit more money, maybe he was a bit more affectionate and that is kind of quite <clears throat> clever in itself in terms of how maybe you might talk, comment, be commenting on the relationship between, um, art or just like, you know, culture and commercial enterprise. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah but yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the 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 bleak conclusion where he gets replaced by a a chicken that can a cheap can, trick yeah, yeah the the, the picking Pythagorean that's what that's the nickname which I thought was another fantastic um little Coen Brothers playful pun there the the picking I think the the picking Pythagorean is what they call him yeah. that little counting chicken yeah yeah so um, it all it all just like the you know the the perspective all just come sort of becomes clear it all it all mm. uh it so, yeah you think they're definitely saying um look people slowly but surely don't care about the the you know shelley ozymandias or the declaration of individual the you know this uh, Dr- lincoln speech at gettysburg and the what you know these values that the country was founded on actually what they're more interested in, in is a, a a cheap trick you know a, a counting chicken um entertainment they don't entertain yeah they don't care they don't care about the sub is that I guess that is, I mean, then what else, What other conclusions are we to draw? Yeah, I, again, um, it's a, just another. I think it's a, just another excellent world building uh, exercise as well, where you know you have somebody who is. Uh, I mean, how 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 is somebody like that supposed to survive in mm. such a harsh world? Yeah. So he's he's doing it to survive as well, uh, which is a. Uh, it's kind of it's interesting. It's just a great. Uh, it does so many things for me. That yeah, it's such a great. It was. It's just so wonderfully done as well. From the story storytelling aspect, the mm. the little set that they built, uh, the performances, everything is just works so well together. 
and you can go a lot of ways with it. Uh, you can mm. you can go a lot of ways with it, but yeah, it, it does. It has the the greatest sense of tragedy. It's throughout, pretty throughout, bleak throughout yeah. the whole film. I think. Yeah. To be to be replaced by the chicken and. <laughs> it's brutal. And you do finally realize that he is just being viewed as a piece of pro- property, just just like the chicken. Mm. And his words and everything he's saying is is just as of little value to the person who's caring for him as it is to most other people. It is yeah. it is uh it is a bit sad. But yeah. And you can draw sort of grander conclusions from from there as well, can't you? But uh mm. but just in the if you want to just keep it uh confined just to the story itself, um it is just very uh very nicely done. Very nicely done. I and, agree. I agree. And very uh very hard hitting. Mm. I think they're they're so they're such masters of pacing. Yeah. And I think when we go into Gold Canyon, um, or whatever it's called, All Gold Canyon, I think is the Tom Waits one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that the because the, the pace that's the pacing of that is really the the sort of the one of the big parts of why it works. And I think the yeah the way they're paced, the way the scenes of him constantly going, you know, uh, I met a traveler in an antique land. And yeah, four score and seven, and we keep hearing it, keep hearing it, different angles of the same line, and mm-hmm. all these different the 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 rhythm of of those. That's just pitch pitch. That's pitch perfect. I think that's as good as filmmaking can. That's why I keep saying I think they're the, they are the best filmmakers alive. And it, but it, the problem is it's so obvious, it's so in your face mm. that that's the case I w- that you kind of see, they, they get overlooked. With, I can't agree with that, but I I think they're I think they're definitely. They're definitely in the conversation, uh, dude. They're, 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 what they do they, is I so I don't think effortless. There's still seeming. some people knocking around who are a bit older, who have done some amazing things. Ha- Hanukkah and Lynch would be the two. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree. I agree. But I I I like Hanukkah and I like Lynch a lot, as you know. But for me, for me. I mean, till approach of morn stained the sky, and our esteem for him stained our trousers. That's much more. That's my pitch. You know, that's my. Yeah. Uh, Hanukkah and Lynch are really they're like you, you know the the mind, the power of the art. There, there is there's some beauty in the fact that the Coen brothers are like hitting these fucking big things, but they're also like yeah, but we're making a cum joke at the beginning because let's not go too far. We're not gonna we don't know anything for sure, and that's the thing that the that comes up in the final story like you know uh certainty is for the fool and so i i really like how tongue-in-cheek they are and how how they can go to these serious places but also not take themselves too seriously they take the work seriously not themselves seriously and that's how i would like to live yeah 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 no i i i i, I definitely they would have to be in the conversation but mm. you know as just a, but i think it's it's personal it, they 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 suit you they suit you in your taste a yeah, little bit exactly. a little you know very well um, yeah almost scary um and the more context i think the more context uh and the more you know about the source material as well i think is obviously uh, enhancing your appreciation of of the film uh, yeah so absolutely there is that as well, well i i often sit with Cohn brothers scripts in hand while while watching them mm. um and and just sort of look at what's gotten changed and and it's pretty unreal uh i'm not talking about trans transcriptions i'm talking about actual shooting scripts like um the big lebowski for example is a very famous one they write the ums and ahs in their dialogue mm. it's insane and they're really mm. um they're yeah I, they're they're I, my they're my guys man i love them at writing dialogue they are the best in my opinion just for writing cr- creative dialogue that just is just a joy to joy to hear joy yeah. to hear and yeah just very 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 good at that very very good i can't i it's hard to think of better uh well aaron sorkin's always famous for his lyrical dialogue but i just think i mean compared to the coen brothers it's not it's not fair i mean the yeah the coen brothers are mm they have this rhythm. They got this fucking yeah, and they change it for each film, and they're 
their command of language is mighty. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Well, that's what's what's the next story after that one? Oh, that's then it's the then it's the Tom Waits story, isn't it? Yeah, we're into Old Gold Canyon. Tom Waits. Yeah. Um, I, ge- I guess is a yeah Can panhandler. You... Again, they kind of go back a bit cartoony here with the, with the whole beginning, don't they? With the with the fish in the water, mm. and like the butterflies. A little bit and Disney, everything. yeah. And they all yeah. kind of and and they all just kind of uh, and the and the deer, they all just kind of they hear the the human the human mankind interference has sort of yeah. en- entered the sanctuary, and they all mm-hmm. just scarper, don't they? Well, I think um, that's a lot about what this one's come, about as well. Yeah, man has come to sort of plunder for natural resources, and this be- beautiful untouched landscape is uh, present you know is presented sort of so many times in this very hyper real, saturated colors. Almost it is it is almost over the top. Because, but tonally, tonally, because well, every shot looks like somehow. a postcard, like a Swiss postcard. Yeah, it does. Where, tonally, yeah. it just does work, though. Uh, yeah. Um, you can really uh, take some, maybe some broader commentary from them. So, in in this one, the obvious one would be, you know, man and nature and the, and the destruction that occurs. Uh, yeah. The gold rush is a very interesting part of American history. Yeah. But then you've also but but you've also got a very very tight enjoyable story mm-hmm. on its on its own, you know, <clears throat> and it's com- <laughs> it can be confined to just that if you like. Yeah. And that yeah. that is a part of the magic of this film, I think. It's mm-hmm. I think it, this this section remind Have you seen The Treasure of Sierra Madre? No. Oh, that's a good old Bogart picture. Mm. Uh, she. Um, that is about Bogart and uh, Walter Houston and I, sorry, I forget the third guy. Um, going up to the mountains and digging out gold. Um, and it's I mean Walter Houston's Houston. I would say, uh, uh, uh Tom Waits's character is probably loosely based off of Walter Houston's performance in The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Um. It's a real famous one. I highly, highly recommend. I think you'd like it. Yeah, it's a yeah. good, it's a good old western. It's fun. It's no, barely even a western. It's a, it's a mining film. It's a film about gold mining and greed. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'd say that at least uh, visually speaking, and kind of in demeanor, um, Tom Waits's Panhandler is based off of that. But the he, jo- uh, Walter Houston's Panhandler character in The Treasure of Sierra Madre is the quintessential panhandler character you know mm. he he's all that caricature like dead government you know that whole ca- caricature has i come out of walter houston in yeah. the treasure of sierra madre i think for sure. i think what's so interesting about this character in this uh story is how his age and how that kind of mm. s- affects your how you see him and how you assess yeah. his motivations i think his age is just very very important to that and it's kind of interesting isn't it you talked about greed uh i'm not saying that i'm not don't you're free to decide you know whether whether this character is greedy or not you don't really ha- have a sense of how wealthy he is but uh you are kind of can't help but be slightly baffled that he is going to all this trouble um and uh just exerting himself so much a bit at and at, at the age he's at, and he's still sort of chasing after gold. Yeah. I, I, mean, I don't know. I did. I, I might, it might. That might be just me, but I just. I, it's it's an interesting part of his character, his age, and how he's still very much on this pursuit. Whereas, uh, maybe it feels like it would be more more of a young man's game, perhaps. Uh yeah, well he does say to Mister Pocket, he goes, you know, I'll get you. I'm old, but you're older. Um, but he, he Def- he's an archetype. They make it clear, uh, in, and it is sort of the young man who kind of tries to, sort of hijack hijack all his efforts yeah. as well. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I definitely felt like there's something important going on there, but 
you're kind of free to make your own uh, well, I think connections, he, he's, which uh, is nice. He, the, like I say, I think the old, old panhandler. The old grizzled panhandler is a bit of a Western archetype, mm. uh, so it's they're they're probably just going for that, and and Tom Waits is just perfect for it. Um, but yeah, it, it, they're, uh, they're the fact that they mention his age and the fact that the the guy who shoots him in the back it, it is so young like, and has like acne scars and is like a looks like a you know twenty year old mm. kid. Um, there might yeah, there probably is something there. Um, I was very much on Tom Waits' side, obviously, uh, throughout that whole thing. I, I never really... I didn't see him as, like, uh, greedy or, or... You know, he, he I think he has respect for the for the land in some way. Well, he doesn't I mean, eat the eggs, does he? He can't... Yeah, he exactly. Does, he that, sees they, the owl and he's like, in. damn, I've got to put the eggs back now. Yeah, exactly. And he goes, come on, how high can an owl count? And he has one. And then it cuts straight to that great overhead shot of the the fish mm. grilling uh the fish and the egg cooking together yeah 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 it is it is it is just absolutely delightful how like charming and charismatic he is in that in that little story but at the, at the end of the day what what he's doing is not very good as well do you know mm. what i mean you kind yeah, of have I that guess. like I guess so, little yeah. dilemma as you you're enjoying the story you're liking the character but you don't really agree with what he's doing but maybe that'd just be me again. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I didn't really. Yeah, I didn't really see it like that. I mean, he's doing what I. To me, I saw it as he's doing what he's got to do. Um, yeah. And you know, he's he's doing the work. Um, yeah, but the worship of gold. Uh, yeah, that whole thing that you know, that's based the basis of base the whole of Deadwood, basically the TV show. And uh, yeah, you're right. It's. it's pretty foul stuff yeah well the whole the gold rush was such a short period in american history and there's the towns that uh are sort of created just from the gold rush mm. uh yeah. that then then they're like soon abandoned after that and they just become like ghost towns don't they uh mm. and there's this yeah. kind of um there is kind of a bit of a haunted legacy surrounding it all uh so yeah, I always tend to think of more things like that as nobody knows when enough is enough when it comes to these things. Right. Right. A bit like a it's a bit like a plain view in uh there will be blood as well. Mm. So yeah, I I do feel like there is that sense of foreboding. Especially how you, the landscape is they make such a big thing out of the beauty of that of that little valley you know it's just yeah. hid- it's just tucked away it's hidden and he comes in fee fi fo fum and yeah like... it feels like he it's kind of spoiled or soiled not entirely but a little bit mm. um so yeah I, that's i do get all of that yeah yeah but can i just say i absolutely love the part where he gets shot in the back and the blood is just sort of seeping into his uh into like the cloth of his teeth. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Where it's just sort yeah, of... yeah, yeah. Again, that's another thing of pacing. They hold on it so long, and it's so right. Yeah, that you know, was, you're oh, he's sure really he's just rolling dead. a cigarette, isn't he? And he's yeah, just led there, yeah. and that blood is just going to get his uh, back is just getting gradually more and more soaked in blood. Yeah, there is. Yeah, that was just tremendous. Like tremendous. Uh, I was happy to see that little uh, maggot be shot through the hand and into the face. Um, yeah, but he's yeah. kind. Of, he is quite helpless and childlike just before he dies as well, and that is the kind of the sort of the ugly side of these these precious minerals. Uh, men, men will fight and die for them. Mm. You know, blood will be spilt. Mm, there will be, and uh, and he all of it. Just that that moment before his death, he just becomes like a child again, doesn't he? Yeah, just for that one moment. Again, very mo- another really moving story. They 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 cover a lot of ground and and it's concise. It's very precise, isn't it? They cover a lot of ground in a short space of time. Mm, yeah. Speaking of which, actually, the next story is the girl that got rattled, which is the longest of all of them, mm. and uh, also has quite a sad ending. And yeah, it, um, it has that you know very tragic tone to it again obviously because 
they meet and they they look like they're going to live happily ever after, don't they? But <laughs> yeah. But then the the you know the the world the harsh reality of living in that world just uh sort of mm. intervene intervenes once again. Yeah, yeah. I I think the characters are real strong. I really like um Mr. Arthur how he's so silent and then ends up being such a important uh yeah part you of don't know story. what to make of him at all and then he just kind of like shows his true colors at the end yeah yeah there's but that. i i i like i uh yeah i'm sort of in two minds about this one i like the characters and everything but i'm not so i like it visually i'm not that's cool it's a good it's a good one i know a lot of people who this is their favorite one because i think and i think this is the one that feels most like uh a move like a classic movie you you could imagine this being two hours you know and and they would call it you know wagon trail uh yeah and 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 it would be like a slowly blossoming love story about going to oregon oregon (laughs) and you know um and and you could see it it's more traditional but um uh, yeah, I, 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 I dig it, but not nearly as much. Excellent as... dialogue again. Excellent dialogue between. Yeah, you know, between Very the two. Good yeah. Um, yeah. I think that I thought the opening dinner scene is brilliant when she's talking about the nervous system and the tendrils going through the body, mm. and she's seen a picture. <laughs> mm. I, I, it's, it, so he, it's true. I've seen that picture too. I've, I've seen that picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's good. I I loved it. I loved it. I think I, there's this this yeah this film. There's just it doesn't it doesn't miss it doesn't lack anything. It's I think it probably needed some some something like this at this stage in the film, didn't it? To to cover to cover all these old bases. But it, yeah, again, it's got you yeah. Know, you're right. You are right. Going back to what I said before. Uh, these sort of uh, strange alliances that can form in a in a world it was such a strangely formal relationship that they had mm. and yeah. uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah. and they they or like already talking about marriage because you know they're just he's going to be a he's going to be like a trail guy yeah living that life you know as he says like sleeping on the ground um mm. and and that Mr Arthur guy is sort of like his shadow isn't it He's like he yeah. he'll be that's what he'll become unless he Exactly. unless he does you know unless he unless he takes a different turn uh, and uh, yeah. yeah so they have this they see the opportunistic moment but it's all still like really formal and there is kind of something quite sad about how do you not think you know there's even though it's nice that they found each other there is a melancholy how it's just more of a a marriage of convenience rather than yes rather than but i think it's, it, it's not you know it's it's because he's like oh uh, you know i don't want to seem hard nosed you know but if we're married we can get 640 acres and you know there is there is a slight tragedy you know there is there is a sort of a tragedy in itself of, of that whereas but, she was on her but, way to marry maybe, a guy in oregon who she never met, so and and she was like all nervous about marrying this man, and she says, "When I think of talking to Mister Whatever, um, uh, you know, I would get you're so easy nervous. to talk to, aren't you?" She says, "You're easy to talk to," which is yeah. There is a ro- there is like a definitely like a blossoming romance there. Mm. But so I think in contrast, it's but in contrast to her arranged marriage, this trail guy is supposed to seem. Uh, a lot more you know desirable uh, natural and desirable but yeah you're right it does still feel uh, a bit forced f- rather formal forced doesn't it yeah well just a little bit formal i would say mm, mm. more so than forced form like form awkward and just like a bit like um romanceless although you can see them kind of when he goes maybe we'll find solace together and she and she goes you know straight as the way uh, you know, <laughs> oh, sorry. It's str- you know w- what is it? Um, she goes straight as the gate, straight as the gate, and narrow the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and he responds and narrow the way. So there, uh, you know, there's some warmth. There I would is, say it's there completely is warmth, clinical, but it's, I don't think it's like accidental that they don't even 
get like he he asked her to marry her, and then the, he was like, they don't even know each other's actual names until after afterwards yeah, he, after he's point. asked as well. Good point. Good point. So yeah, I I think they're they're do, they're doing something very interesting there. Uh, yeah. Again, it's not. There's something a little bit pessimistic about it. <laughs> yeah. Like very pragmatic uh, romances, you know, when it's not sensei you know like sensationally sort of swept off your feet love at first sight sort of thing i are probably just much more realistic into in, in the world especially when people reach a certain point in their lives like that character has done he's like you know think about my age now i've kind of you know i need to, i need to kind of do this now i need to get this done yeah I yeah think, it's literally you know, i just need to I think get this that done is very yeah very yeah. kind of true of of people not just in that world, but just in in our, in every all worlds, in, in, our world, in, the, yeah. in in today's world. Yeah. So, well, like you said, it's alliances just to get just to get by, just to get through. Yeah, yeah. just to get by, just to get just it's just so, just to survive, just to, just make, to yeah, get her maybe down. salvage a bit more comfort. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and obviously, it doesn't work out. Nope. In that scene where she kills herself, the way the um the way that uh, Arthur, Mr. Arthur gets hit over the head by the guy mm. hiding behind the horse. That is so well, like you were saying earlier about the staging of the attack. That again is really nicely staged. Like you're seeing his point of view. You see the guys retreating. You see a few straggler horses cross frame. And then you see him and then you see another horse kind of getting close and then sudden reveal from the other angle. Uh, it's really well done. That was a real mm. surprise uh, first time I saw that. Yeah, yeah, Was yeah. No, ready. that that is yeah, fantastically done. That all of that sequence as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean you can't fault anything like that in terms of actual movie making craft and skill. There's a, uh, they don't miss a trick in mm -hmm. this one. They really yeah. don't miss a trick. Everything is tip top. Everything is wor working at in a at a very very good level, where just allows the story to flow doesn't it um yeah it's just uh, they're just so good at what they do it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like uh hard work um for them okay like make um, it they make it feel very easy it's not it's easy to watch but i'm sure it's hard i'm sure i'm sure there's a lot of uh i imagine them to be more more of like a i might be wrong but i imagine them to be more in the kind of a Kubrick vein, mm. where they do agonize over everything. Oh, they're, yeah, then they are known to be rather tyrannical and pretty, um, yeah, pretty. But, they know what they want. They know exactly what they want from you. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of actors don't want to work with them and don't like that. Like that's why Nick Cage only only made one thing with them, um, where because because there was a lot that, and they find found it hard to work with each other. Um, mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> if you hear Nick Cage, then talking about working with lynch on wild at heart he mm -hmm. talks about how lynch and him he lynch told him hey look man can you just put all of this like kabuki this like stanislavski whatever you all of your acting stuff can we just have a good time can we just have fun can you not do go method on it and uh and for lynch um cage agreed to just have a good time on wild at heart but it's yeah. um but yeah that i think yeah the Co the coen brothers are famous for being pretty pragmatic and pretty uh, exacting and, mm, and yeah, knowing exactly yeah. what and they want. And you can want. tell because it is that kind of precision, mm. as we keep mentioning, doesn't happen by accident. That is agonized over. Um, so... Costume design and production design and art direction that's mm. not just like, okay, we've got a Western town, it's a Western town. You know, the difference between Frenchman's Gulch in Buster Scruggs and then you know the the towns in meal ticket They're completely different the way those towns would be and they they could, i'm sure they could have easily been shot on the same back mm. lot but you know they're really careful with how yeah. yeah what's funny is how the set looks in the in the last in the last act when they arrive at that ho strange hotel mm -hmm. yeah the houses are are they don't look like houses it looks like a movie set and I found that really, really interesting. It, yeah, How the trees to, yeah. are all kind of, it almost looked like pantomime, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, and I found that a really interesting creative choice. 
just to we might as well get on to the to the last one because I'm sure we're gonna have a lot to say. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, let's get on to that. The um, I think I obviously it was a yeah, clear choice. It was definitely shot on a soundstage and probably well, I think they probably project looked like maybe it was back projection because the you know the scene starts at kind of sundown and then it becomes nighttime and mm. so slowly the sun sets as they are talking uh, and slowly the sun sets on their lives um well this is kind of the the big finale that which does underline this this theme of death and yeah. but also kind of life and life philosophies different people who have had different differing life philosophies are all kind of having chance to sort of compare and talk mm -hmm. yeah um which is a great way to end things um it reminds me of um i uh, uh it and this is a bit of a coen brothers nerdy thing to say but it does remind me of the scene in hail caesar where the rabbi the priest uh the f movie studio guy uh and uh, one, uh, one other guy, they're all talking about faith and Jesus. And do you remember that scene mm. where he's like, they're talking about, you know, we're I making. I feel like I should do because I've seen it quite, it wasn't that long ago since I watched it. It's when Josh Brolin is trying to make sure that the script for, for the Hell Caesar picture is now. like, yeah, course, yeah portraying yeah, Jesus now. well. Yeah, they and they yeah, all, they, it absolutely. ends up devolving into like a theological discussion about, yeah, you know, yeah, and, and they can't agree on anything. Yeah. yeah and yeah, and yeah, that, yeah. it reminds me of that scene, but taken seriously where it's, they, yeah, they, yeah. they, they, they're, they're like, cause yeah, I, I, I absolutely love that scene in Hell Caesar. The fact they have the absolute gall to write a scene like that, where, where the rabbi is going like, uh, you know, well, New Testament God doesn't like anybody. He's like, well, he likes Jews. Yeah. That's you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's it's great. What, yeah. what what you're saying? God has a son. What he's got? He's got a wife and a dog. You know, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, it's that's that's a great scene. And I think um, anyway, this this final section reminds me of that. But yeah, you're right. It's people talking about their life philosophies whilst on the way to the next realm. You know, the other side, passing through. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's. It's difficult to know what to say about it, really, because it is uh, it is such such tight. From a writer's point of view, it's very tight, and it's very uh, where they they start they they at first they're totally unaware, aren't they? Mm. They're yeah. totally unaware of where they are, what they're doing. They think they're all going on some like trip. They don't know what's happening, and gradually they realize don't they i mean they, mm -hmm. they begin to realize as it's going along yeah um they suspect and yeah. and how it ha and how and how it's such a gradual thing i think is just lovely yeah rather than like oh my god you know what i mean see they they they, they never they never do anything sensa like sensationalist do they 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 never they never go for that option it's all, it is always so um it is also all quite. It's always very muted, isn't it? Um, in some respects of what what they do when they are trying to, when it is a, a climactic, um, when they do reach that kind of stage, mm -hmm. they, it is always quite strangely m muted. And I just absolutely love how it just gradually dawns upon these characters of, wh of where they are and what they're actually where they're actually going. Let me ask you a question. Do you think? Um, because we've been talking about how the Coen brothers always have, you know, a little bit of their tongue in their cheek and they're not taking things too seriously. Uh, I, I don't, th this is tough. I don't think they are taking this final scene as seriously. And this is the first time I thought it on this fourth three watch. I picked up on a few things, um, because like like three people in a stagecoach on the way to death talking about their the their philosophies behind life it's f it's cool it's fine but it's too on the nose for the cohens that it's too uh, i do think they are trying to do something else in there and i'm going to point to the frenchman um there is there are a few references to french and french things throughout uh, the ballad you know, all the stories mm -hmm. um Frenchman's Gulch is the town that Bal uh, the Buster shows up and then eventually is killed in. Um, 
when when Thingy is robbing when what's his name uh, when Franco uh, Frank when yeah when James Franco is robbing <laughs> the bank the guy's got his hands up and he's going he said his daddy was from France that's the last word he says and he stutters over France quite a lot um, right I'm pretty sure there's a reference. Um, uh, Long ago, the the girl who got rattled. I think there's a reference to France in there as well. I th- I I would imagine there would be references to France, um, uh, in most in in all of them. Maybe I maybe I missed. I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. But um, anyway, Why do you think then, that is well. You then you have this Frenchman, who is going. You know, you cannot. Uh, also, there's the Frenchman in the 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 saloon in the Frenchman's Gulch who says, "You have regarded the cards." I love that line. I just had to mention it. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. You have regarded the cards. Um, but but yeah, the the, the 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 second Frenchman in the final um story, he says, "Oh, you can never really know a man. You cannot know the true spirit of a man." Um, yeah. I think they're taking the piss. I think they understand how how much of a sort of pretentious ground they may be walking on here. And they kind of, they're like, well, what better thing? Bring in a Frenchman to like, you know, wax philosophical. Um, uh, uh, Yeah, I don't think they're taking it entirely seriously. Um, And I'm not... He's the guy, like the gambler. They're all kind of like, they're all like archetypes, archetypes, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's uh, like the solid there's the solitude the spiritual and the kind of the uh and the gambler who just sort of goes goes with it um mm-hmm. i think uh yeah they i mean they're how it's very cartoony again isn't it how they how they are they you know they take up these very sort of cartoony sort of poses uh and uh, you know when they're going up the stairs in the hotel, and it's just like light shining from mm. the top of the staircase as well. Yeah, I mean that's again extremely cartoony as well. Um, so maybe they just—I think they just found this kind of nice little tone, this nice little pocket where they could work in and nice do Mr. Pocket do some things, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't, but without ever seeming to. Uh, like it would, it would never. It's impossible to get too serious, even though they are talking about pretty serious things. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still some. It's all still very uh, comic. It is, I mean, the the guy with the the tracker guy, and he's he's just hilarious. Uh, the trapper, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's told like people are like ferrets. Uh, yeah, and yeah. This this yeah. So there's all of that. I mean, if they were actually were trying to make a a serious comment on on like life and death and what does it all mean maybe they maybe they've done it in the best way mm. and just have it you know ha- have it have it, plenty of jokes in there have have like these sort of kind of stereotypes um mm. it's just very it's just a very little enjoyable little sequence uh yeah and and i think it's so good that point where he says uh they People like the story because they 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 want it to be them. They uh, see themselves, but not yeah, not entirely not them. like them. They don't yeah. want it. They don't want to be. It, it doesn't want. They don't want to be them at the end. They mm-hmm. don't want to be the one who actually gets caught. Mm-hmm. I think that's just a, a great, great little sort of another little sort of insight that they're just sort of dropping in there as well. Yeah, because I think they're they're com- they're commenting about their role. As yeah, exactly. Filmmakers and or just storytellers yeah. in general, and that's and and why people love the stories and people want to hear about themselves. People want to relate to themselves, but then all at the same time, they can quickly choose when or not when or when it doesn't suit them to 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 be mirrored by the character in the story. Yeah, and I think that's a very very. Uh, I find it very true. It rings very true to me, and uh, and uh, it also kind of just kind of kind of kind of shows they do they they do they do have an understanding of what they're doing. Mm. Well, um, Ethan Ethan's like it studied philosophy at school and 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 stuff, and the Joel studied film, and um, yeah, I think it, their humor is really the saving grace. But they combine those two real well. And they keep it funny. They keep it funny. That's the key. Is they keep it 
enjoyable. Mm. But uh, so I, I, uh, I, I'm not huge on the guy with the cane. Um, he's, I would say, the weakest thing about the f- the whole film. Um, I really, I, I don't, I don't know. I just don't, I don't. Um, who's what? Who's that? Blend, Brend- I love it when Brendan Gleeson just no, starts singing the. Folk when Brendan Gleeson sings, it's one of the best bits of the film I and mean, it's fantastic and obviously he's singing the um basically the theme of the film which is um the streets of laredo um but obviously he's singing the original irish ballad that the american streets of laredo was based off of so yeah, obviously they know I, their shit they know where they're what they're referencing and they know i think they're referencing songs. the role of they're they've referenced the the role of storytelling um, cause he's like, when I'm watching them, you know, I'm wondering if, if they make sense of it all. And it's like, how mm. can I know I'm only watching? I think that is referencing film as an art of storytelling. But I also think obviously they're, they're huge, uh, love music lovers as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that when he just does that spontaneously, spontaneously for no reason at all, mm. and everyone just kind of sits there and is sort of drawn in by it. I think that's kind of them talking about uh you know the storytelling art of music yeah and song yeah um and they're referencing it quite plain in terms of our its role along in life along the way and how 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 it serves us it doesn't mm-hmm. have a a rash, it doesn't have a rational or logical purpose it just makes sense in its own way and that's what i take from that and i actually i absolutely love that moment when that just happens cuz that mm. just for me is um again it just sits very well and and rings very true yeah no the way the way he sings that and the, you know he's got his little irish um draw to it um yeah it's a really powerful good moment and the fact that you've had mm. the orchestrated version of the melody line being played the whole way through the film like that's I, that's I the didn't first thing that, you hear just, oh 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 yeah well that's the yeah that's the first thing you hear is is as the you know when the book's being opened you hear this the, the melody of the streets of laredo one of the most you know famous cowboy songs again to mention deadwood there's a fantastic scene season two finale of deadwood where um al swearingen sings this exact the, that exact song um the the unfortunate lad is what it was called in ireland but the streets mm. of laredo is, they changed it um but it was set it was originally set I, I i don't know if it's irish i don't i don't know I, but it but it's yeah it was a, the the lyrics were slightly different and gleason sings the original lyrics and so and it's about you know it's about a cowboy being taken away after he dies and you know make sure they have roses so they can't smell my corpse and uh so it fits per- you know perfectly with the themes um yeah and gleason was p- yeah performed it beautifully really really nice it's just a lovely mm. moment um, when when you say the man with the cane are you mean do you mean his character i mean no i mean the other guy um yeah i mean the other guy the other guy i'm not yeah i i uh, it's tough to explain but i just didn't like the cut of that dude's jib i didn't i didn't like him i didn't think i didn't believe the actor i didn't i didn't i i liked what he said i.e you know i'm the one watching and i like to see it in their eyes but i don't know something about that character didn't wasn't great for me i don't know i I honestly think that character is the weakest part of the film for me yeah but after everything else that i mean he is like very theatrical and and again cartoony so well ev- mm. after everything that's happened <laughs> in this film how how could how could that how could that be uh if you I mean you just probably might not like it but you do you think that they've sort of gone over the top in any way with, with him mm, i understand he doesn't he, he doesn't fit in the he doesn't fit into the world in the well, same way as everything I, else I, I, does. I would i understand he's trying to hearken to a vaudeville uh, 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 sort of host, uh, one of those old vaudeville kind of shows, but and I'm, I mean, he's like supposed to be Satan or or, or some sort. Of, I I don't know, you know. Harb- uh, I mean, that whole carriage thing. It's like who who's the Grim Reaper there? Who's the you know whatever? Who knows? So the, I don't think there's any point in actually putting a uh, being definite about anything to to mm-hmm. go with the uh, fur trappers philosophy, but. 
Um, I I think it might be a case of the actor just not quite being up to snuff. I it's, it's yeah. I just because I the, the dialogue's fine. Uh, the 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 idea of the character's fine. This sort of vaudevillian kind of trickster showman. But I yeah, it's weird. He does stand out as the one character. I don't think they're crossing a line. I just he doesn't yeah he doesn't work for me. It's, it's a mm. it's. My only criticism of the film truly is that character. It just puts me off a bit. I'm like, ah, this isn't... Mm. I think it's mm. just as playful and, you know, slightly ridiculous as um, Buster Scruggs' character, as, yeah. you know, something like as it in the first part. It's, it's of that similar pitch, mm. which at this stage in the film, I'm perfectly... I'm, at, I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm just lapping it up. <laughs> so I'm tired of it. Fair enough. So I had a, yeah, a, a very different reaction. Oh, no, that's fair enough. I mean, it's it's a very minor quibble, but um, I yeah, something about it doesn't seem right. Um, but yeah, everything else worked well, and I like the Frenchman tapping his little top hat before closing the door and just going, "Fuck it, what will be will be. Yeah. Let's go." Oh, great! It's a great little mini character studies again done. Mm -hmm. Done in such a sh done precisely in such a short space of time, it's mm. such concise storytelling yeah. throughout the whole thing itself, the whole well, film. It's just that's um, their writing. They they just, can really yeah. create three dimensional characters very quickly. Yeah, well, I think it's a it's part. It's number one again. Ellen Chenoweth casting brilliantly. You know, finding that trapper, but also it's dialogue. You know, they know how they know how to write the dialogue and they yeah. get the right the right. I mean, the Coen Brothers bit parts where, you know, it'll just cut to a guy in a bank or whatever. Um, oh, we have forgotten. We must mention Dave Rawlings and Gillian Welsh having written When a Cowboy Trades yeah. His Spurs to Wings. I mean, well, I think they, perf they performed the song at one of the big award ceremonies. The, yeah, they, they performed it at the Oscars. Was the Oscar. I was in, the Oscars, I was yeah. in, yeah, I was in Mexico watching the Oscars with the Mexican family who were loving the fact that Roma was nominated and were really excited mm. about that and i i would never actually seen the oscars until that year right, i never right. actually sat down and watched it and um out of nowhere dave rawlings and gillian welsh in these potent white and red nudie suits come out and sing when a cowboy trades his first wings i that was the yeah, highlight that was the best best moment i was so surprised and uh, yeah. overjoyed by it their harmonies although, are so tight on that that their version yeah, although is so i'm good. not particularly fond of seeing them in that setting though if i'm being honest but it was still it was still nice well, you think but... it's too too mainstream for them or what but just i don't i may i associate the oscars with kind of more pedophilia sort of evil evil establishment <laughs> sure sure well yeah yeah i'm I, I, yeah but the i mean the cone brothers are part of that evil establishment man well i don't know they 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 they, they, they sit on the peripherals quite nicely i think i think they played the game well I think they got one foot in, one foot out. They've yeah, carved okay. out. They've carved yeah. out a very, very good niche for themselves, haven't they? Mm. They basically can do what they want. They get the money. They get the backing. People take interest in their work, and they and they are and they are quite peculiar in terms of yeah. what their interests are. But they still and they and they but they are sort of embraced by the mainstream as well. I mean, they're they're sitting in a very nice place, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. Tell me about it. But I don't think they. I don't think they fully. They don't fully embrace any kind of mainstream acclaim that they get either. To I mean that to my knowledge anyway. Yeah. No. You're right. You're right. I think they're quite. They're quite happy just to sit on the edges and do as long as they get to do their own thing. They're happy. Yeah. Yeah. Which is Netflix. Um. Most of the time, it's funding projects which wouldn't t wouldn't interest me, but. Every now and then, they yeah. come up with they they come up with one which is they do a good thing a little gem yeah. a little gem, mm -hmm. like such as this one or the or you know the latest Charlie Kaufman one as well which was a yeah. Netflix original uh, yeah. Pro yeah a Netflix original as well wasn't it? Yeah, I was very excited for this film to come out and it delivered massively. Um, so uh, yeah, I I love it. I love it's it. It's always death. exciting when one of your favorite artists produce their best work today mm. isn't it it's a very yeah. it's always very exciting yeah 
when they've yeah. kind of sort of outdone themselves, which I, I think I think they have with this one. They just they it kind of just it does sort of indicate that they're just sort of getting better and better. But I think they had to make quite a lot of films to get this one. It's a very very in- interesting mixture of a lot of other styles they've already tried yeah. out. Yeah. There's Absolutely. a bit of there's a bit of Hail Caesar in there, as we've already mm-hmm. said. Yeah, there's a bit of you know there's a bit of True Grit. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So which which we've already re- referenced and mentioned. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. There's a bit of the dialogue aspects of you know Fargo or Raising Arizona. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, it's it's a real, um, it's a miracle. Honestly, this film is a miracle. Yeah, the fact well, that Netflix funded it and they were like, yeah, we'll do this. Uh, the only you know the only reason. It's because they're the Cohen brothers that that they get to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, to say that it took so long to make as well. Normally, projects are, that take so long to make may may never get made. So the mm. fact that this one did eventually mm. and and is and is as good as it is is does make it very special. I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, by the way, just as a little Easter egg. Um, mm-hmm. In Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Mm. There is a tiny little scene during a montage where Gillian Welsh asks a shopkeeper if they have the soggy bottom yeah, boys. Yeah, 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 I remember, yeah. I noticed that the second watch. I was like, <sighs> yeah, Gillian Welsh. Gillian just getting a cheeky little day's pay on a Cohen set. Yeah, Love yeah, that. Yeah. They're just like, yeah, we could th- yeah, throw- that's a great role for her to have, asking for a, for a soggy bottom boys record. Um, and so it's great to kind of have that come full circle with Tim Blake Nelson starring again and a, singing a song written by Gillian Welsh. It's kind of a nice little, yeah, collaborations sort of, yeah, getting going further and further down the line. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, man. Um, well, I had a lot of fun watching it and uh, talking about it with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Screen Dreams. Come back again next week when we'll be talking about Agnes Varda's 1985 film, Vagabond. 